Anyway, all right, let's get started. Our text today is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. We're making our way now through 2 Corinthians on Sunday mornings, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, after having completed 1 Corinthians. So once you find your way there, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along. If not, that's all right. I'll begin reading in verse 7, where the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, writes to the Corinthian church, and our hope for you is firm. Because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, verse 9, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Let's pray. If you would join with me, we'll ask God's blessing on our understanding. Lord, would you, at this time, Focus our attention and quiet our hearts and minds that we might hear you speak into our lives through your word in that still small voice of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're here today. We want to hear you speak. We want to hear your voice. There are so many voices that are so loud and clamor for our attention, but it's your voice that we want to hear above all. So Lord, will you speak? Please, your servants are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated, thank you. So today's teaching is going to be part three of a series I titled, What Trials Produce. I think it's becoming abundantly clear as we go through this series that the trials God allows into our lives are always for his glory and our good, or if you prefer, his glory and our betterment. God has a purpose in and through those trials that he allows into our lives. The work that the Lord is doing in us And the preparations the Lord is making for us are accomplished in and through those fiery trials. Oh, how I wish that there were another way. Oh, how I wish there was a pill you could take. I mean, my goodness, they have pills for everything else. Have you seen these commercials? And and no side effects, you know, they they don't have that that really melodic and almost hypnotic music in the background, you know. Um, This might cause internal bleeding, organ failure, and death. As somebody there is on the television screen with the biggest, most beautiful smile on a beautiful face, and you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, I'm going to take this medication that can cause side effects that are worse than that which I am taking the medication for. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Oh, how I wish there were a pill that could accomplish that which God can only accomplish in our lives in and through those fiery trials. There's no shortcuts. The first thing that fiery trials accomplish in our life is peace with the Lord. And we saw this in verses 1 and 2 where the Apostle Paul begins with an all-familiar greeting saying, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And the implication here kind of carries with it the idea of not just peace with God, but it's also the peace of God 
that Paul describes in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 as surpassing human understanding. Have you ever had a situation in your life when you've been in a trial and you have this inexplicable peace? You almost have this perfect peace and your flesh is screaming at you. You should be really worried right about now. Everything around you is falling apart and yet you have this peace. This peace that Jesus said he came to give not as the world gives. The peace that is not predicated upon, contingent upon the circumstances in your life. Regardless of what's going on in your life. You can have that perfect peace that Isaiah says he will keep you in perfect peace when your mind is stayed on him. The second thing that fiery trials produce in our lives is the comfort from the Lord. In verses 3 and 4, Paul says that God is the father of compassion who comforts us in trials and it's so that we also can comfort others with the comfort we ourselves received. There are those trials that are allowed entrance into the life of a Christian that cause us to experience the comfort that can only be experienced in a trial. It's the comfort from a father who is compassionate. Last week, we looked at our third one in verses 5 and 6, which is endurance in the Lord. Here, Paul talks about how their distress was for the comfort and salvation of the Corinthian Christians. And then he says this. He says that it produced a patient endurance. And it's not just this patient endurance of gutting through and getting through the trial you're in but along with that patient endurance is also a triumphant overcoming it's an overcoming it's what jesus said john's gospel 1633 records it jesus says in this world you will have tribulation you will have trials but be of good cheer be encouraged you want to know why? Because I have overcome the world, and so will you. You will get through it. You may not get out of it, but God, true to his word, has promised you that he will get you through it. Well, that brings us to our text today in verses 7 through 9, where we see the fourth thing that fiery trials produce in our lives, and it's that of a reliance upon only the Lord instead of relying upon ourselves. And this is what I want to talk about in our time together here in 2 Corinthians today. In verse 7, Paul says, hope for them is firm. It's unmovable. And this because he knows that just as they shared in his sufferings, so also they share in his comfort, almost by default, if you will. Then in verse 8, he tells them not to be uninformed about their trials in Asia, of which there were many. <laughs> and they were under so much pressure in the midst of those trials that they despaired even of life. It was as if they had been given a death sentence. In other words, this is how it ends. Have you ever been in a situation that was so perilous, you thought, this is it. <laughs> I don't see how God is going to work this for the good. This is how it ends. This is how it ends. I do not see any way possible for God to see me through this. Well, Paul says in verse 9 that it was so beyond them that they thought they would die. But, and here's what I want to talk about, it was for this purpose that they would rely on God and not themselves. Here's the question. What is Paul 
referring to when he says that basically we saw this as a death sentence. Which of the many trials that Paul was the recipient of caused him to experience such intense difficulty that was beyond his ability to endure, causing him to despair even of life. We don't know specifically. But what we do know is that there were many times of tremendous difficulty in the life of the Apostle Paul. And he was reluctant to talk about it. We'll see one place where in an autobiographical statement, he gives us a snapshot into just some of that which he experienced. But if there was ever a man of God who could speak to the purpose of difficult trials in the life of a Christian, it was the Apostle Paul. I suppose you could say he earned that right because of all that he had been through. When we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives us a more specific detail as to all that he experienced, and he does it in the context of rebuking the false apostles of that day. In verses 23 through 28, he bluntly writes, Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews, no less, the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times. I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. And that's not all. <laughs> I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Wow. You want to compare sufferings? I don't. I don't. Boy, any time I think I've got it hard, and sometimes as pastors I have to confess, we lament that's the pastor's word for complain. It sounds more spiritual and sanctified, you know. <laughs> we lament. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> it's really complaining. Oh, Lord. It's, ministry's hard. This is hard. <laughs> All I have to do is go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and it gives me that much-needed perspective. You think this is hard? Really? You've got it really good, my friend, really good. Well, I hope you know that Paul isn't boasting, or for that matter, even complaining about how difficult his life has been. Instead of complaining, he's explaining. He's explaining that God has allowed him to experience such difficulty in order to accomplish and produce a work in his life. What is that that God is desiring to accomplish? Well, it's that of Paul coming to the end of himself. Now think about this. If there was ever a strong personality, was it not the Apostle Paul? I imagine him having a very intense personality. I imagine him even in some ways being very intimidating. And sometimes that can be an asset, but other times that can be a liability. Sometimes some of us are too strong for God to use. We're too strong in ourselves, in our own strength, in the energy of our own might. And the tendency is to start 
trusting in yourself, in your own ability. And again, Paul was not exempt from this. And this is why God had to bring Paul to that place where he had no other alternative. He had to throw up his hands and say, Lord, I cannot do it. I heard many years ago on the mainland of a three-step approach. Not 12-step, three-step. And it's very simple. It's almost too simple. It goes like this. Number one, step one, realize that you can't. Step two, know that God can. Step three, you ready for it? Wait for it. <laughs> Here it comes. Let him. Let him. What is it about us that insists on doing it my way? Really? And, and God will let you do it, do it your way until you realize it ain't happening. And you come to the end of yourself and you surrender yourself to Him and you say, God, I can't do it. I imagine the angels given charge concerning me responding from heaven with, it's about time. <laughs> what in the world is up with you? What took you so long? Had you but come to God sooner, you could have spared yourself, bludgeoning yourself up against the will and the way of God. Is not God's way better? Oh, we say that. We quote Isaiah. God's ways are higher than our ways. But do we really believe that? Do we really believe that the God who knows the end from the beginning knows what's best for us? And he has to bring us to the end of ourselves so we trust in the Lord and rely upon the Lord and oftentimes he brings those fiery trials in order to accomplish it. Chuck Smith in his devotional wisdom for today, great devotional by the way, he writes this, it is good to come to the end of yourself that is when you finally reach for God. It's a good thing. And it's a God thing. One commentator said it best this way. Those fiery trials caused Paul to rely solely on God. Like Paul, the tendency of most of us is to try to solve our problems with our own strength. Therefore, as he did with Paul, the Lord brings us to the end of ourselves from time to time. He brings us to the point where we feel pressed beyond measure, despairing even of life, in order that we will have no other choice but to call upon him and find in him greater strength than we could ever find in our own ability. If you were to ask me what I thought was one of the main reasons that God allows trials in our lives as Christians, this would really have to be it. Above all, more so than the other reasons, this to me is one of the main reasons. It's that of bringing us to the end of ourselves so that we have no other alternative. We are completely out of options. We have no other choice but to completely rely on and trust in the Lord. And here's the thing. I've experienced this in my own walk with the Lord. I'm sure maybe you have as well. God oftentimes has to remove from us anything or even anyone that we're relying on instead of him. And that can be very painful. 
if I'm trusting in and relying upon my resources, then there does come a time where God will deem it necessary to remove from me those resources that I am relying on instead of him. And it can be a very painful thing, but it's a very good thing. Why? Because of what it is accomplishing in our lives. One of my favorite guys in the Old Testament is Gideon. I really like this guy, and not for the reasons you might think. I know I often say that, you know, we're going to meet these guys in heaven, and I, I often wonder, uh, are we going to recognize them? I, I don't imagine there's going to be name tags, you know, hello, my name is Gideon, you know, hello, my name is JD, hello, my name is Noah, that would be weird. But I, I just wonder if we're going to know them when we see them. But think about this. We're going to meet these guys. And, and let's just say for purpose of discussion that we're going to know who Gideon is. He's one of the first guys I want to go up to and go, Dude, <laughs> what was that like, man? I mean, talk about God removing that which you were relying on in order to deliver the Medianites into your hands. That was Gideon. I find it interesting that, and it's such a humorous, I mean, I, I realize I don't want to take away from the seriousness of this predicament that he's in. I mean, truly, it is a life and death situation. The Medeanites threatened the Israelites, and God calls Gideon, of all people, to deliver the Israelites out of the hands of the Medeanites. And when God appears to him, he's hiding in fear from the Medeanites, threshing his grain so they wouldn't steal it. And the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. I could just picture Gideon going, Where? <laughs> Me? Yes, you! You're kidding, right? And it even gets more humorous because... And Judges chapter 6 records the argument that ensues on the part of Gideon who tries to convince God that he's basically pulled the wrong file. God, you've got the wrong guy. And Gideon even tells him why he's got the wrong guy. He says to him, I am the black sheep of my family. Strike one. My family is the black sheep of my tribe. Strike two. And my tribe is the black sheep of all the tribes of Israel. Strike three. I'm out. Find somebody else. Not so fast. And by the way, this is why he puts out two fleeces, a fleece two times. And you, you would think, I mean, the first time, okay, God, if this is really you, I'm really the guy, then let the dew be on the fleece and not the ground. And God says, whatever. He didn't say it like that, but that's what he does. And then Gideon says, well, just to be really, 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 really sure, then just have the dew be on the ground, but not on the fleece. And God's like, okay. And he does it. You might say that at this point, Gideon is out of excuses. He has nothing else. And unbeknownst, to him, this is only the beginning. He hasn't seen nothing yet. God still has to remove what ends up being 31,700 men from his army. Now, keep in mind, he's got 32,000 men, and the Medeanites have 135,000 men. And God says to Gideon, uh, I'm sorry, but you've got, you've got too many men. And, and the way that he has to dwindle them down to 300 is such that he has Gideon go to them first. And can you imagine this? He has to go to them and say, if, if any of you are afraid, you can go home. I can just imagine the first time he says it. It's not in the text, but I'm just thinking that this might have been how he would have done it. I know I would have done it like this. If any of you are, <laughs> you can go home. 
What, Gideon? If you're afraid, you can go home. And 22,000 men bail. Can you imagine his heart sink? What is God doing? Gideon, I don't want you to rely on those 22,000 men that just bailed on you. The implication being Gideon was relying on those 22,000 men that just bailed on him. Well, he's got to take out another 9,700 men because he's still got 10,000, and that's still too many. And we read in Judges 7, verses 1 and 2, this. Then Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Medeanites into their hands. God, I, I think you mean the men that are with them are too many. No, Gideon, the men who are with you are too many. You want to know why, Gideon? Here it is. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Translate it. If I give you the victory over the 135,000 strong army of the Medeanites with even 10,000 men, they're going to try to take the credit for it. They're going to take the glory for it. And no glory will, there will be no glory in no flesh will glory in my presence. I will share my glory with no man. You might say at this point that Gideon has no other choice but to trust completely in the Lord. The Lord has already promised him that he will give him the victory. But what the Lord has not told him is how he's going to do it. The way he's going to go about it. He's going to go about it in such a way so that there's no way that even if they wanted to, they could ever take the credit for that which God alone could do. This, by the way, is why I believe the 300 men, when he whittled it down to 300, and the 9,700, picture the scene. And those of you who have been to Israel with us, we have been to Gideon Springs. Picture the scene. you got 10,000 men there. And God says to Gideon, I want you to have all of your men drink water from the spring. And I want you to separate the men who stick their face in the water and just, <laughs> just drink. I want you to put them over here on this side. And the ones who just cup the water and bring it to their mouth, I want you to put them on this side. Can you imagine Gideon watching man after man times 9,700 stick their face in that water and you gotta know that Gideon's not thinking oh he's gonna send the 300 that cupped it he's gonna send he just got done telling me I had too many men so you know that he knows that God is gonna send the 9,700 home now you've probably as well as myself heard it taught that the reason that he chose the 300 men who cup the waters because they were the mighty warriors. They, they had their eyes on the battlefield. And they would not give unnecessary attention to a necessary thing, that of drinking water. But that doesn't fit. That doesn't fit because if I've got 300 top guns, 300 green berets, then I could still take the credit. Man, you should have seen us. These are the Navy SEALs, man. These are the best of the best of the best of the best. It doesn't fit, does it? When I first heard this taught, what I believe is the right way, it just opened my eyes to it. It is believed, and I believe this to be the case, that the reason that the 300 cupped the water and brought it to their face was because they were the lame, blind, and crippled, if you will, who could not bend down and stick their face in the water. 
That fits. That fits. Think about it. You got the black sheep of his family, the family, the black sheep of the tribe, the tribe, the black sheep of Israel. You got 32,000 men. And God says, you got too many. You'll rely on them and they'll take the credit for the victory. It makes sense, doesn't it? It fits. Can you imagine? I, I, you'll forgive the humor. I know that I have a weird sense of humor. And they have clinical terms for, you know, people with my sick sense of humor. But could you imagine these 300 men after they defeat the Midianites going back to the camp of the Israelites on their walkers and their canes? Oh, you should have seen us. Trying to take the credit. There's no way. That, there's no way. And here's Gideon looking at the 300 men. Great. Great. This is what... You're going to deliver the Midianites into our hands with them? Are, are you serious? And I can just hear God say, watch me now. Watch me now. Let me say this. I, <laughs> I really believe that God will do for us, not to us, for us, that which he did for Gideon bringing us to that place where we have no other choice but to trust and rely on and in him completely. Let me just share in closing one final thought, personal thought, as it relates to our building. One of the things that God has been doing in my life is bringing me to the end of myself so that I have no other alternative but to trust in and rely on God to get this building done so we can occupy it until he comes. And the way he's done it is the way he did it with Gideon. And here's why. So that when we're in that building, even if I wanted to, I cannot stand behind the pulpit in this beautiful, and I mean beautiful, new church building and say, hey, the reason we're here is because of, and then you fill in the blanks. Wow, Pastor J.D., how did you guys do it? You know what the answer is? We didn't. We didn't. We couldn't. He could, and we're going to let him. We're going to let him for his glory. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you as painful as trials are in our lives for that which they produce, and especially with this producing of a total reliance upon you. Lord, I pray for anybody here today that is struggling in a trial, a difficulty, that you would encourage their hearts and they, they would anew rely upon you. In Jesus' name, amen.